and I say this over and over, people don't believe me, but when they see it in social, when they see some reviews that are very genuine and honest with typos or some funny slang, they really do believe it. And I think it's so powerful to put this content at the right time in front of the right product, and it just really does complete the cycle. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. We've been covering a lot about the future of the store experience. What will it look like? How will we combine traditional design and visual merchandising with technology? And how will we create spaces that our communities really love? When I think about the future of store design and experience, one of the first people that comes to my mind is Parrish Chapman. He's director of enterprise sales key accounts for Samsung, an overall thought leader on the role of technology in the store, and most of all, how brands and retailers can use some of the value drivers of digital, see data, and apply it into their store strategies. It's a very complex topic. We got into as much as we could in 30 minutes, but I think it'll provide you with a great thought starter on how you can integrate technology into your stores in a meaningful way, how you can use data to drive more meaningful and valuable decisions for your store experiences, and most of all, how social media can support these physical community-driven experiences and also create that air of connectivity and authenticity that so many brands are looking for. Parrish, it is great to have you on the show finally. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So to start out our conversation, how about you share a little bit about you and the work you do at Samsung? Obviously, I know you, but our audience maybe doesn't. So let's start there. Great. So I have the honor of leading the team for Samsung for the U.S. market that focuses on retail, digital innovation, but also enterprise office and some high tech as well. So with that, obviously, Samsung is a household name. In some ways, someone has seen Samsung, maybe uses Samsung. But what unique value are you and Samsung collectively providing to brands and retailers? Yeah, I think the big secret, the clients that work with us and Samsung is that we have a global view and we talk about risk mitigation and tech obsolescence. And we really are focusing on data and trends. And because Samsung is a very large company, we have trend data and we do a lot of different projects and we leverage that information to support our clients to reduce risk and to speed them to market. Even like Samsung ads, Harman, we own Harman. People don't realize this. So we really can bring a combined view to an account to support them. And they don't even realize the consulting, engineering, and the technology they have available to them by using Samsung, just by looking at our digital displays or some of our software and analytics. That's great. I'm sure all of that data and insight and of course, the expertise of your team are incredibly valuable in your conversations with retailers and brands, like as you consult them, try to guide them. And obviously, the foundation of all of that is the consumer, new behaviors, new preferences, and everybody is talking about, you know, what behaviors from the pandemic will stick in the long term and how will that dictate retailer investments and strategies. So, I mean, what behaviors do you think are most critical to call out? Which ones do you think will be sticking in the long term? I mean, forever, basically. Yeah, and I think what's really amazing is we've trained people to use displays, all sizes of displays. And it's we know that shopping starts at home on the sofa and goes right to the store. And so I think the trend that's going to continue is people want to access information, shop at home the same way they'd shop in a store, Right. I think that trend is going to continue. I think the pandemic shopping trends, the ease of access of digital will continue, reducing friction points, but also taking payment and orders the way the consumer wants to submit them will continue. So that automation and reducing friction and then offering a great digital experience like somebody would have at home is very important and will continue. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it kind of leads me to a follow-up question because everybody's talking about the shift to e-commerce People who previously didn't shop online started to, and they realized, oh, hey, this is pretty easy. I think I'm going to keep doing this, right? So do you think that is 
a threat or a challenge? Or is it more of an opportunity? Because you're talking about eliminating friction, right? Like when it comes to the physical in-store experience. So, I mean, could it be both like a challenge and an opportunity? How do you look at this at Samsung? So I think it's a large opportunity. I think we train the consumer to use digital displays on the refrigerator. We talk mobile devices and now interactive displays and they want information right away and they want great information, right? So I think it's a major opportunity and a benefit for most retailers. I think the opportunity we have with is connecting legacy systems to make sure we have a true omni-channel. And I think that's really the opportunity we're looking at. We do know the customer, a lot of our clients can start a transaction at home and finish it in store, right? With salons or retailers, or even at a hospital, right? Booking appointments. So I think that it's a major benefit And I think what the pandemic has done has made our problem the same for everybody in the U.S. Before the pandemic, people really thought their problems were siloed. But really what it allowed us to do is really focus on the shopper experience, really focused, and drive this change behavior to retailers and all our different clients. And it's been a benefit, really. Yeah. I think your point around being able to start at home and finish in the store, I mean, we all have it through our mobile device, right? Like that's kind of like our connecting point to everything. It's that source of continuity and seamlessness. But I know Samsung outlined in a recent report some of the key e-commerce benefits or, or digital benefits that retailers should keep in mind, especially when thinking about the future of the stores. I thought that was a very interesting way to think about it and guide your audience. So with that, I mean, what does the physical store bring to the customer experience that digital simply cannot provide? Because like in the report, you're talking about like e-com slash digital benefits, but like there has to be, it's like a yin and yang, right? So I mean, what does the store bring that digital can't and how can they support each other? Yeah, and I think it's, you have to have both nowadays, right? I think we all agree on that. And I just feel that brands need to have a physical relationship with product and digital at the same time. And we see that digital companies that started digital, everyone from a razor company to a mattress company, that was all online. Now they're opening up you know, shoe stores, they're opening up brick and mortar. Because I think what they felt is people wanted to come by and experience the brand, the human factor, and you can place great digital with great product at the same time. And then you build that cohesive feeling for that brand product and services they're offering. And I think people really do crave that. And I think what the lockdown and the pandemic showed us is, yes, you can have an all digital brand, but people do want to feel and feel the sense of great digital and product together and a location to complete that brand identity. And I think that's so important right now is that brand identity with the digital and physical And people are really understanding that and mastering the art form of it. Yeah, for sure. I know it's interesting covering like e-commerce specifically because a lot of like the direct to consumer slash digitally native brands, it's like they reach a certain point of growth and then they realize, oh, wait, like if we want to reach a certain level of expansion or brand awareness, like we do need a physical space. We do need a way to convey that brand story or brand identity in a more meaningful way. But it's interesting because you think of like the benefits of digital and like the power of e-commerce, like there's that scale, right? Being able to reach so many people at once, that ability to personalize at scale. And then of course there's that insight, that data that you can collect about the consumer, their behaviors, their preferences, and then find ways to fine tune and improve the experience over time. My question for you is, is it possible or how is it possible to bring some of these value drivers into physical spaces? Because like physical, it's like the brand is coming to life, it's storytelling, it's beautiful design, but technology can help augment that, right? So how do these worlds kind of come together? So I think what I'm really passionate about and most excited about is our competition is digital and e-commerce, right, and a website. And I think what people really love about websites is the data you have from the clicking. You can understand where your customer is traveling on that website. And I think over the last 12 to 16 months, what Samsung's really been focusing on is treating the physical store like a website and having that unique set of subset of data to know how digital is working how we're impacting the buyer during their journey in the physical space and how we can get them to stay longer and shop and then reduce those friction points. I think when people used to come to Samsung, they were looking for a one-off or an LFD, a display, 
Now we're talking about ecosystems. We're talking about analytics and really understanding the lifetime value of a client to that digital physical space, right? If it's enterprise office, even treat it the same way you treat like a normal transaction or even healthcare, right? And how long they're staying in the facility, where they're moving in that facility and can digital change their behavior in the physical structure like you would do at a website. Yeah, it's so cool. And it, and it kind of leads me to think about just how the evolution of in-store technology has occurred over the past few years, especially, right? Like I remember seeing my first like store of the future concept, right? It was Rebecca Minkoff. It was amazing. I still think about it. I still refer to it because it was so cool and so, so memorable, but also made like a lot of sense for the brand, right? And like what the consumer ultimately wanted to get out of that brand experience. But now we're also talking a lot about ease, convenience, in some cases, even safety, right? Like technology helps facilitate that. So how are the retailers you're speaking with thinking about bridging the gap between digital and physical? Is it like going one way over another, like entertainment versus function, or is it kind of a mix? You know, I think it's really a mix. I, we look at our customers three different ways. We have customers who are currently engaged in a digital transaction and they just want the best product. And that's great. We want to supply them. Then we have tech curiosity people, people who are looking at a kiosk to reduce friction points and allow the consumer to own the transaction, or tech curious, or the latest LFD, micro LED, and they're doing an experience that they want to put their foot in the technology world a little bit, or they have an idea of how they want to have a really great experience in an enterprise lobby or a hospital lobby, right? And then we have the trusted advisor, and this is where we're coming along beside them and doing a complete ecosystem and really developing a three-year program for them. And I think the difference in that customer and those other two is they're really looking at a long-term content plan, a long-term omni-channel plan, right? And they understand when we talk about tech obsolescence, our biggest opportunity we deal with clients, even if it's a one-store retailer or a mass enterprise retailer, is that what they've already spent and how they use legacy systems and how they transition to a new system. And we're really helping all of our clients do that in the finance vertical, government space even. And we're really, really trying to be a great partner when it comes to transition of technology and then the future of technology. So those are the three types of customers we have. And I think the hosted solutions we have now allows us to speed the market very quickly, a lot less low cost, if you will, than in the past technologies. And I think that's something that really has changed the last 24 months. It allows us to speed test and scale quicker to help out our clients. Got it. So a quick follow-up question for you, if that's okay. So those three types of customers, is that something that like you kind of qualify them, you have discussions with them to kind of identify their goals? Like how do you figure out like where they should go and like ultimately how you should guide them? Yeah, we asked a really set of questions when we originally talked to clients. So they really don't understand how we can support their business with Harman, for example, with sound, sound directional, right? Or is it special lighting you want to have in your experience with digital, right? When you think about the senses, smell, sight, sound, we really can help out. So we really want to talk to those clients and support them with their vision. Do they have a content strategy, right? Do they need help with content scheduling? One thing all our clients have really come to us and said is they've had to refocus their talent of their internal talent pool during the pandemic to really support their operations So they lost some IT support. And with our hosted solution and our knock that's 24-7, that could be global support. We take that burden away from them and really support them to show the ROI, to allow them to what they do best. If you want to run a hospital, you can be the best hospital administrator, but we can help you run this digital platform, monitor the equipment, even do the installations and servicing automatically built into the price if you want. So I think that a lot of this depends on our clients, and we do ask questions up front. But more importantly, if you want to buy one display, we're here for you. But if you want to have a robust consulting program and you really look at the strategy, like social media right now is very important to our clients, a lot of them. And we have a way to bring in social media into the brick and mortar experience or the healthcare experience or the government experience, right? And we have a way to do that as well. So I think the point is that we do interview, we discuss, and we try to develop a plan that's really well thought out that matches their needs from a human aspect, 
talent pool, but also budgetary. Yeah. And I'm really glad you brought up social media because full context for the it's audience. It's my favorite, by the way. I love talking about it. <laughs> I so know. let's go. We actually were able to do a webinar together and the whole topic was around integrating social media, user-generated content into the physical experience. And of course, Parrish and I both nerded out for a good like 45 minutes or so because it's that opportunity to, again, bring digital into the store experience, but it also brings that layer of like community and influence and authenticity. So I know you noted like you work with retailers, but also like hospitals, all different types of businesses, right? How are you seeing the role of content evolve or even accelerate, speed up for all of these different types of businesses, right? Because I'm seeing so much around community-driven commerce, community-driven experience, and, and social kind of is the big guy in the house. But I mean, what are you seeing there? Yeah, first of all, we have to have a content strategy. And that's one of the things that really talk to our clients about that we try to help and align with them. And even if we cannot help them, we try to find a partner to help, right? And most of our clients change out contents once a quarter to be very direct. Maybe it's seasonality, maybe it's a holiday. Maybe it's a fundraising wall at a hospital. They're doing a big fundraising. And what we're seeing is, and the analogy we like to use, if you play the same 10 songs on your audio system in your government building, enterprise space, retail or healthcare facility, people will not be listening after a while. Matter of fact, they may run. Content's the same way, right? So we want them to have their normal content, right? Their normal content that they use, their, their content they're really focused on. And then how can we augment that with social UGC, user-generated content, but also Google reviews or other reviews we can pipe in. And I say this over and over, people don't believe me, but when they see it in social, when they see some reviews that are very genuine and honest with typos or some funny slang, they really do believe it. And I think it's so powerful to put this content at the right time in front of the right product. And it just really does complete the cycle, right? And it can be anywhere from a menu board at a food restaurant that people are talking about a brand they love. And we're seeing all kinds of great quotes that we can use during the order cycle process, be it fashion, healthcare, a doctor that's really done a great job in the community. But more importantly, I think something you mentioned about, what is the brand doing to support the humans, right? What are they doing with their ecosystem? How are they benefiting besides selling something? And brands are really leveraging social now this way. And we need to be sure we have that type of messaging inside the brick and mortar as well the great things the brands are doing for benefits and donations and supporting the local community. So while you have a national or a very big picture story, you really can have a very direct local story that I can relate to when I'm in California, or if I'm in New York, I can relate to. And I think it's very powerful. And it's getting the, the speed to which we can do it and the cost has really come down. And we need to be taking care of this as brand ambassadors. Yeah, it's so fascinating. And with that speed and efficiency, being able to put these highly localized experiences into your stores and power by your community is, I mean, the value is clear for me. But I do want to add an asterisk here, too, for our listeners that it's also there is management there, right? Because I know anytime user-generated content is involved, people go, Wee! like... <laughs> security, right, security, a redundancy, approvals, exactly. And even from the standpoint, we ask people at the platform, uh, Sprinkler is our partner on this, but let's say we're using Sprinkler, whoever produces that content, let's say it's TikTok or wh whoever it may be, there's an ask that we can use this content and store this. So it's a very robust approval and security system. And I thank you for mentioning it. It is important that we say that it has a bunch of secure protocols and approvals that need to happen, but it is automated, but ultimately there's an approval process. Awesome. All right. So social media in the store, digital displays, what other tech is kind of rising to the top as far as bringing the power of digital into the store experience? What do you think is most important? And what are you hearing from retailers as far as like, oh yeah, like we want this, like how can you help us get this in our store experience? So social is number one, one of the biggest things we're doing right now, having that feeling and bonding of genuine content that people can relate to is our number one ask and which we're delivering. Number two would be, we used to be limited by the canvas. You know, when you think about the great painters and artists of our time, they were limited by their canvas. Now with LED, the cost is coming down dramatically. Quality is wonderful. The life cycle of LED is beautiful and how to repair it is, is really streamlined now. So we're seeing a big stance in LED transformation 
And so when you reach a certain size, like especially video wall is transferring to LED, that's a major trend for us. And with all our clients, be it healthcare, government, no matter what the aspect is, LED is just coming on great because of the cost reduction and the efficiency of the canvas and what you can do with it. And then I think the last thing that people are really asking us about is how do we understand digital is working in the store? And we talked about this, you know, we brushed against it very quickly earlier, but we're doing some visual dashboards now where we're, we're connecting when people spend on social media. So let's say a local retailer in Iowa, choose a city, invested in some social media. We now have the opportunity to book those buys and, and note them in a calendar and combined, did in-store traffic tick up in front of the store? Did we convert at the door? How long do they shop? And what we're seeing is if we can increase the average shopping time three to four minutes based on the average for that brand, people convert. They convert 50% more. So digital is very powerful in that. So what we can do now is take the spend that people are investing outside the location on the sofa and draw conclusions without having integrations. But we have data points and not one data point is accurate. But when you have multiple data points, you have a spend, you have store traffic in front of the store, we can monitor conversion at the front door, time in the facility, weather, right? And we can use all these data points on one dashboard then it becomes pretty amazing what we can tell them about their business. I'm so glad you brought up the data because that was going to be my next question for you. <laughs> uh, number one. <laughs> yeah, because like I know anytime in-store technology comes up, it's like, oh, well, the ROI. And like, how do we how do we figure out like what the true value is and how do we sell this thing? But there's also a longer term approach, right? Like, okay, how do we use this as a vehicle for more data-driven decisions. Like, again, we hear about it from a digital marketing perspective or an e-commerce perspective, but like, how does the content we use in store impact dwell times or engagement with products? Like, there's probably a whole other level of KPIs and insight that you can get from these new in-store data capabilities. Is that right? Absolutely, and we're doing that today, and we're doing it without penetrating the existing IT stack. A lot of the problems with all our clients, no matter if they're operating a hospital, a government building or a retail location is the infrastructure sometimes is maxed out or it's very secure. They're doing transactions. And so we can't penetrate that IT stack unless we have a year's worth of commitment and investigation and it slows us down, right? So a lot of the technologies we're using, we're running on an LTE 5G network that's standalone from the existing if we can't penetrate the existing Wi-Fi or IT stack in a location. So number one, I'll tell we solved this problem by having a standalone system that's very secure that allows us to speed and test quickly and develop for the future. So that's number one. Number two is we have different ways to achieve data. Some of our clients may already have some Wi-Fi sniffers. They may have beacons or video cameras and laws are changing. And this is a caveat about data. I wanna be sure I say it very intently. You need to really beware. We're looking three years ahead of time. For example, we all know the government is looking at how we trace back consumers on mobile devices and everywhere else, which impacts our retail experience. First party data is becoming very important to all our clients. How do we leverage that to really optimize the experience? And so we're really concerned with PII and global GRP compliance and all our technology solutions we're installing today. We looked at this risk 24, two, three years out to make sure that our retailers or whoever it is just pushing data is compliant. And then we can use different subsets. So if they have technology today, we can actually take that sensory data if they've invested and actually use it and figure out how to re-leverage that infrastructure spend they did on technology, why we transition them. And so I think the biggest request I have when I talk to our clients is, what have you spent on? What have you invested on? How can we leverage the existing technology why we transform their business. But data is very important, as you mentioned. Well, that's great. So to the end, we're coming up at the end of our time together, Paris, sadly. But we've been covering so much about the evolution of the store, how the role of the store is more important than ever. But now is the time when a lot of brands and retailers are rethinking the role and the type of experience they want to create for consumers through their physical experiences. So with that, I mean, do you have any closing 
thoughts or recommendations for all the folks listening who may be going through this process now, who may be looking to optimize their tech investments, and if you have any ideas or predictions of where you think this space is going, why don't you try and throw that in <laughs> too? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I think we're moving very quickly. And the partner you choose, you need to think two years, three years out, right? And have a plan. You need to have a content strategy. And more and more, what, I'll, what I advise our clients, we're dealing with social marketing. We're dealing with marketing, linear TV, CTTV ads, right? In-store technology, ADA, store design teams. And so you really have to have a partner that really does understand how to bring these groups together and to have a complete solution, be it omni-channel, but all these, even real estate stakeholders, traffic in front of the locations, renegotiating leases, the technology we're installing today can help out all these groups inside a company. So be sure that you choose a partner that really does understand how to navigate that and, and offer a solution that you start with the end in mind, right? When you talk about tech obsolescence and risk, I think those are really the important things. But the last thing I'll lead you on, some of the amazing things we're seeing is we talk about net promoter score a lot of brands. We're seeing the net promoter score improve when new technologies is installed and done the right way. But the benefit that I think is really amazing is the ENPS, the Employee Net Promoter Score. We really sometimes don't really talk about the employees and the benefit of technology to them. And I can tell you when employees reduce their friction, they have the best technology when they come to work. We're really supporting them in a new and a different way. And even they can build their brand on social media as well, right? Fashion, beauty, or a, in a personalized shopper, or a nurse in a hospital, right? It allows them to have a glue to that brand and build their image as well. So think about the benefit to all people involved inside a company, how to best move forward with a two-year plan, and then they side benefits to your employees and how it really does support. Love that. That's a great way to close out, especially when you're thinking about getting all the right people in the room to develop your plans. I know... We hear time and time again how sometimes like the design team has a great idea, but then IT isn't aligned on it or they want to employ new technology in the store. But how do you adapt your displays and all of your merchandise plans like around those devices and experiences? So it definitely does require a completely new way of thinking. But Parrish, this has been a fascinating conversation. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you. So thank you again so much for doing this today. Well, thanks for giving us time. And like I said, we're very passionate about supporting our clients. I would challenge anybody, just call and ask us. Even if you're not a client today, are you concerned that you have to be a huge company to do business with Samsung? That is not the case. Take advantage of our, our abilities to really guide and be a better partner to you. And thank you for the time today. All right. And to all of you, if you do have questions for Parrish, definitely take him up on it. He has a lot of great insights and expertise in this quickly evolving space. So drop us a line on Twitter at our touch points or on LinkedIn at retail touch points. We'll be sure to tag him so he can join the conversation if you have anything to say. And if you like this episode, we would love to hear from you. Leave us a rating or review on your preferred podcast network. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, frankly, anywhere else we're there. And be sure to subscribe. We're having these conversations weekly with everyone from tech gurus to analysts to strategists, designers, retail executives, the whole gamut, a lot of interesting stories. So subscribe and be sure to get new episodes weekly. But for now, that's it for us, everyone. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.